So um, I was asked if there were going to be any um, MATLAB exercises, but uh, there will be uh, some examples worked out in MATLAB in this presentation. But I'm not going to ask you to do anything as we speak, because from my experience, that takes a lot of time. And uh, there's lots of trial and error. But the, uh, all of the examples I am uh, showing here, I will post the uh, MATLAB code that's used for them along with the presentation PDF. So you could uh, play with them uh, on your own time. Um, <coughs> so, um, so the topics that I've chosen for this tutorial are um, uh, observability and observer design, uh, controllability mm -hmm. and sort of optimal uh, controls in certain cases. And then I've included in the end a, an example that I think is very illustrative for distributed systems that uh, highlights the dist distinction between distributed control and, and pointwise control. Uh, so the, the examples are quite simple, which I think is very good because one can probably see um, through uh, all of the details. Um, if, if I could uh, have a show of hands, how many of you have actually had a controls class? A class in, in, say, classical control theory or state space control design. How many of you have had such a class? Very long time ago. <laughs> um, okay. But everybody is comfortable with differential equations? So that's, that's sort of my, my minimum requirement. <laughs> Wait, we got, uh, we got laughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's hard how many people can do How many people are comfortable with differential equations? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe. All right. mm -hmm. I believe what I'm going to show you maybe can be interpreted at a um, at a level maybe that transcends the equations. So, <laughs> so we'll see how successful I am. Okay. So, um, uh, if any of you are not familiar with actually block diagrams, because when um, um, I teach, I am, by background I am an electrical engineer, but I teach in a mechanical engineering department. And then electrical engineers are very comfortable with boxes and arrows going in and out of them, but mechanical engineers initially are not. And so really, uh, I have at some point one, if you've never seen this before, I have to define for you what a block diagram is. A block diagram simply is a set of equations that have to be satisfied simultaneously. If you've ever used the uh, software package Simulink in MATLAB, and you bring in a block, and you bring in another block, and you connect them with an arrow, what it's doing inside of its uh, parser compiler is that it is actually writing down the equations. Each block is a set of equations. And then an arrow connecting one block to another says this variable is equal to that variable. So and, uh, these arrows are constraints. The blocks are a set of equations. So in the end, when you write the entire block diagram, you've simply put in some constraints on the equations. You've written a, another set of simultaneous equations. So this block diagram is trying to uh, illustrate the typical control system uh, architecture. But the process is the underlying system to be controlled. Ignore this delta, which I'm not going to talk about today. This is a representation of things that you don't know about the process dynamics. Say, for example, you want to control a, a robotic arm to move, let's say, a link this way. And you model that as simply a, a, a mass that is subject to a torque and moves according to its moment of inertia. That's a two second order differential equation. Uh, but in reality, this arm has a little bit of flexibility. It's actually a flexible beam. But you choose to ignore that. Because if you were to model the flexibility, you would need, you'd need many, many more states, many more modes. This delta might be a representation of that neglected part of the dynamics, is the flexibility. And one can formalize this so that you can sort of bound how much away you are from the real system using the process model, which in principle might be much simpler than the uh, real system. So that's as far as I'm concerned. 
Now that I've said that, you can forget about it for the rest of today's presentation. Um, so typically, the way control systems are designed, at least using state-space methods, inside the controller, there's actually an estimator. So the controller is actually those two blocks together because the output of the process is here. It goes through this portion of the controller. There's an internal loop inside the controller. What this is is an estimator. So here, for example, the process has, say, 10 state variables, but out comes one of them or a linear combination of them. I'll show you examples. And then what the estimator does is it tries to estimate the 10 state variables from that single output. And you might think that that's how could you do that. Uh, that's an under, very underdetermined problem. Indeed, at a single snapshot in time, this would be underdetermined problem. You cannot estimate 10 states from a single output. But as you observe over time, and you know the dynamics, the estimator has a model of the dynamics inside of it, you get, a lot, you get much more data and you're able to actually do this estimation problem using the observer structure, which I will show you in a few minutes. So then you have an estimate of the internal state of the states of the process. And then the controller is a rule that tells you that if you knew the states, what would be the control action to take? This is typically referred to as a separation structure or some, uh, the separation principle. And it often holds, sometimes it doesn't, but it's a very useful paradigm for many control design problems. So this notion of observability I'm going to talk about now uh, addresses when can you determine the internal states from the only measurements of a few outputs. You do that by constructing state estimators. You then combine that with a uh, controller uh, and then you ask about the closed loop performance. So I'm not going to actually show you this. I'm going to talk about estimation first. And then I'm going to talk about the control problem separately. Okay, so here's, here's the, the problem set up in a little bit more detail. So this is for linear systems. Uh, the, I'll tell you what you do in the case of nonlinear systems as well. So this equation, x is the state. The, sometimes I will use x as a spatial variable. But here, x is the state. And I think of that as a big vector. Uh, that's a differential equation, by the way. So the time derivative of the state, the current state, uh, is equal to is a linear function of the current state, the input to the system. That's the input that's uh, provided either by the controller or maybe exogenous disturbances. And then there is some noise. This is called um, process noise. These are forces, random forces, that could be buffeting the system or uh, on basically things you cannot measure directly, only indirectly through their effect on the outputs. And then the output y, I should really show the dimensions of these. There, there are a few outputs, maybe one, but there are many, many states. So this matrix C is a big, fat matrix. Uh, so the state then goes to the output by a linear combination. If it were a nonlinear system, this would be a nonlinear map. The input may directly affect the system. And then there's also measurement noise. So this is another, these F, V, and W are noise terms, but they play different roles. This W is measurement noise, while this noise, think of it as sort of random forcing of the state. That, would that be internal noise? It, it's not internal in the sense that it comes from, you assume no, normally it comes from an exogenous source. But one interpretation of it is that if there's a lot of noise here, then your model of the differential equation is incorrect. So it is how much you trust this model. Mm. So if, there's a large, if the, this has large variance, that means your equations without the noise are only satisfied very approximately. So this is the, the variance of this reflects the lack of trust in the model. The variance of this reflects the lack of trust in the measurement. And so they're, they're, and they play different roles. Is noise V not on the diagram? Uh, this is measurement noise. No. But, uh, but yeah, but here it's, it's a bit simpler. So here would be double, G would be the identity in this 
diagram. Yes. What about v? What about v? And, and v would be here, where v would then enter as b would be u plus v. This is if this is a summation. So this is a little more general than the diagram I have here. A general diagram would have disturbances, which would be the v's going straight into the process block through maybe possibly a different matrix. And I would have, um, uh, well, I would have a G matrix here. Yes. So, so you, uh, second, you're saying you can uh, adjust F and G uh, to reflect your fate in the... Uh, so, so nor yes, so normally, uh, well, or where the noise enters. So for example, I may have certain equations that I believe more than others. And so their, their relative size of V, for example, if I assume V to be white Gaussian noise, then it's through the entries of F that I control, so how they enter the equations. And similarly, I may have some sensors that are better, more accurate than others, and that's reflected in this G matrix. But yes, so one noise, what's called process noise, reflects your belief in the model, and this reflects your belief in the measurement. Um, okay, so uh, the question now is, you, what you would like to design is from the small number of outputs, you wanna estimate the many states. And of course, as I said, with a single snapshot in time, it's an underdetermined problem, you can't do it. But as you collect measurements over time, every measurement, must satisfy the system equations, and your knowledge of the model gives you further and further constraints that makes the problem less and less underdetermined. Up to a certain limit that's determined by the stochastics. Okay, so this problem can be solved. Uh, the least squares, corresponding least squares problem can be solved. But I'm gonna show you maybe a slightly different way of thinking about it. Uh, so let's ignore this for now. Okay, so, so here's, these are my class notes, but I think they're, they're not bad. Um, so let's look at the linear case, and let's ignore the noise for now, just to, to have a simple construction. So let's ignore, and then I'll show you what happens when you add both types of noise. So here, x dot equals ax plus bu. So this is the, your state vector, a very, think of a very large vector. Actually, let me draw this, because I think it's very important. Oh. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Can I erase? Okay. Because I think it's important to keep the dimensions in mind because that's really, that determines limits of performance. So this is x dot. Think of hundreds. Maybe, oh, maybe. Yes. The A matrix is big. And typically, So these are the control inputs. You typically have a few control inputs. I'll show you examples when I play around with this dimension, compared to the number of states you want to control. Otherwise, the control problem is very trivial. If you have uh, as many controls as you have states, what you have is basically a completely actuated system. And the control problem is very simple, usually. But so, so the, the interesting things happen when we have a few inputs, but a large number of states. And the, for the observation problem, the interesting things happen when you have a small number of outputs and a large number of states. Okay? So keep those dimensions in mind. <coughs> um, this is called the state equation, by the way. That's the differential equation written in first order derivative in time. <coughs> it tells you that the, the reason this is called the state is because if you know the vector x at any given time, you and the, <coughs> and the input for the future, you have all the information you need to solve the equation for future values. So the state is sort of the minimum amount of uh, information needed to know the system's trajectories forward in time. And now the question is, I observe y of t. So let's say I have uh, <coughs> I have a state in this, the state space, let's say that's uh, uh, you know, vectors of uh, x, vector of dimension 100, and I observe a single output. So corresponding to that, 
I observe the output. I observe the output over time. Single output, but observed over time. And I want to determine a 100 uh, component vector. Okay? So uh, let's think about one simple way you could do that. I cannot determine x directly, but I know this, the model. I know ABC. This is a very important. So what would you? You might want to build a simulator. So build a parallel system in your computer that simulates these dif this differential equation. You know A and you know B. And I'm going to assume that you know the input you because you are feeding the input to the system. So you know everything except the initial state. Okay? So you can build the simulator, run it, and run the system, the real physical system in parallel. What you would expect is some discrepancy. Let's see where the discrepancy comes from. Uh, you can actually write down this is the differential equation for the state, uh, for the estimator. This is the differential equation for the system. You can write down the error. This is the estimation error, x minus x hat. Hat will always stand for estimate uh, here. And if you write down, it's actually a there's a dynamical system for the s for the error. And a little calcul algebra tells you that it is equal to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, E dot is equal to A, the original A matrix, uh, times E. So it's an autonomous system with no input now. The input has been canceled out because you know it. And these are the error dynamics. Okay. Now what might be a problem? Uh, you can build your estimator, but you don't know how to initialize it. And so if you don't know how to initialize it, an initial error means an initial non-zero state. If A, for example, is unstable, then the error will blow up. So how can you improve on this? Well, here's the very nice idea. Uh, here's your estimator. Let's, you can add whatever you want to the estimator. You're building it. Here's the key idea. Your estimator is a simulation of the system plus a correction term. And the correction term is some matrix for you to design times the difference between the actual output and the predicted output. This is what your estimator says the output should be if your estimate of the state. So y hat, which is the predicted output, is c times the estimated state. This is called the prediction error. And so you would like to use this prediction error. If this is 0, you shouldn't do anything to your simulator. You're, you're right on top of the, of the actual state. But if this is non-zero, uh, then you should do something. OK? So in this case, you want to design this matrix L so that this has favorable properties. And how do you do that? You can, again, uh, so this is actually the structure of the observer right there. OK? Um, you investigate the error. So this is the structure. You, you measure the output. You know the input because you're providing the input typically in a feedback control system. That goes into your, I use the words observer and estimator synonymously. Uh, and then that is your uh, estimator x hat. To study this system, look at the error dynamics. Now the error dynamics are no longer E dot equals AE, but there's a, uh, an additional term. Okay? And again, keep in mind the dimensions here. So A minus LC is a big matrix A. Those two are given by the system dynamics. And then this is for you to design. And now the question is, can I design L, the matrix L, so that this has very favorable properties? For example, I can choose to uh, <coughs> take all of the eigenvalues and have them have very negative real part. So I can get very rapid decay of the error. Turns out that's not a good thing to do. Instead, you should do sort of the optimal filtering problem. But all filters have this, all sort of observers have this structure. If you had a nonlinear system, what you would do, typically, what's done, there are more sophisticated versions of this, is these would be the nonlinear dynamics of your system. The correction term is typically 
linear in the prediction error. But there are other versions of it. But that works, that's called the extended Kalman filter when it has that structure. And you design L in a certain way. Okay, so any questions so far on this? Yes? So I forgot, how do we know A and, a and B? The, you know the system model. You're given the system model, right? You know the dynamics. Of, that's very important. Yes? But um, if, you just, oh, so if you know the plot and you know what the state variables are, then you can do that. But don't you if you know what this, this, you mean? Uh, not it's presumably the state of the plot. Yes, yes. But if you can't look inside the you plot, can't look it's a black yeah. box. Mm -hmm. If you cannot, yeah. then you estimate it somehow. Well, that's what this problem is. You can't look inside the black box. You're trying so to estimate the state. The okay, I, I, I know the dynamics of the box, but I can't measure x directly. So in the inverted pendulum example, I know the length, I know the mass, I know the mass of the cart, but I can't put a sensor to measure the cart's position so and velocity right. and the angle. I only measure, say, the angle. Right. So I don't know the state. I can't look inside and measure the state. But I do know the dynamics, meaning I know the parameters of the system, and I know the differential equations. Yes? And how realistic is this for a real system like a plane? Like how good do I actually know the dynamics? <coughs> Quite well. Of course, what you need to do is you need your observer to tolerate errors, small errors in your model. And the typical way it does that is by, as I said here, or at least one version of the estimator is by where was my, uh, oh, there. The size of this term reflects your belief that this differential equation is satisfied. So you remember, I pretended that this is the differential equation. Now I'm going to do a version of the problem where this is a random uh, process. And now this reflects how, uh, how this equation is violated. And so my, my filter should be, if it, if it responds well to having a stochastic V, it should tolerate errors in the model. This works very well in general, yes. Uh, uh, airplanes fly with this. Weather prediction uses this. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been tested quite extensively. So here you mentioned the extended Kalman filter. What would so be the, here you mentioned the extended Kalman Yeah. What so would be a <coughs> Non the standard common filter. I'll, I'll get to it in a. Uh, okay. I'll get to it in a couple of slides. Yes, because I'm doing now the non-noisy case. So in the non-noisy case, you go and do what I told you. If you can design L such that this is stable, <coughs> and there's a mathematical condition, which uh, is called observability, which determines whether you can or cannot do this. There's an, a nice, a necessary, and sufficient answer for this. And then you have stable dynamics. And if you simulate it, you'll see responses like this. Your real system starts at this state and does something like that. Your estimator starts somewhere else because you don't know the initial state. And they, the error will converge. Even if this is an unstable system, even if the state is going off to infinity, this estimate will converge and go to infinity with it. Right? Because it's been designed to have stable error dynamics. Um, Okay, so again, as I said, uh, well, <coughs> this is used for weather prediction, but uh, um, the, here again, the state of the system is the entire flow field uh, and the temperature fields and maybe pressure as well. Uh, whatever you want to include in your uh <coughs> meteorological model. And then your measurements would be, say, weather stations in different places. Satellite measurements, sometimes they give you sort of aggregate um, <coughs> measurements. <coughs> and uh, um, weather balloons and so on. And those are a small number of measurements for this gigantic state space, which is the entire flow and temperature and pressure field. Um, and the underlying equations are the neighbor Stokes equations and so on. Um, so, so this is selection, but let me get to the noisy case. Uh, actually, I may not have it here. Uh, <coughs> here's what the Kalman filter is. The Kalman filter is the following. Tell me what the covariance of this noise is. And tell me what the covariance of this noise is. I'm going to design for you the optimal estimator. For those of you familiar with estimation, <coughs> 
The optimal estimator turns out to be the maximum likelihood estimator. And for Gaussian noise, turns out that the optimal estimator has exactly this structure. That can be proven rigorously. The optimal means maximum likelihood estimator actually has this structure for linear systems and Gaussian noise. And the Kalman filter basically is just an algorithm to uh, compute using linear algebra techniques. It also solves the Riccati equation to compute this matrix L. That's really the key. But think about it. Think about what this L means when you have really large systems. If you are simulating the entire uh, uh, weather system, say, across the US, uh, the state variables, so the dimension of L is a matrix that has the number of rows the size of the state. So that's your discretization of the weather system. That could be millions of variables. And then the, the number of columns is the number of measurements. So that could be maybe in 100 or so. So it's a million by 100 for these big problems. And calculating it is, is, a, is an area in itself, but uh, these things are done. I'm going to show you what it, how you do that for what the response looks like for small systems, which I think capture the, the main uh, patterns. <clears throat> Let's look at a very, very simple example. This is the simplest example that illustrates uh, model-based filtering. Okay? I have a mass connected to a wall with a spring and a damper. My state variables are the position and the velocity of this mass. I'm going to assume the mass to be unity. Okay? The input to the system uh, which is not that important for, for this filtering problem, but we might as well have it. It's just an external force on the, math, on the mass. So if I do F equals MA on the system, there's an external force, which is my input U. And then it's subject to the spring and damper forces. And here's an example. This is a spring constant of 1. Remember, this is the derivative. This is X1 is position, X2 is velocity. Uh, this is the derivative of uh, velocity, so that's this last equation here is F equals MA. <coughs> Mass is unity here. Spring constant is 1. The damping constant is 0.3. So this is a system that would, you, you hit it, it will oscillate, and the oscillations will damp out. Hmm? And I'm observing the position. So I'm observing the position of the mass. And I would like to estimate the state. What does that mean? I don't need to estimate the position, although I might because <coughs> Excuse me, I may have additive noise. So I may low pass filter that measurement. And then I want to estimate velocity because I can't measure it directly. So if you didn't know anything about observers or common filtering, it would be the, your, your simple solution would be um, take the position measurement. If there's a lot of measurement noise, low pass filter it. You may have to play around with the bandwidth of that filter. Uh, to get velocity, I want to differentiate that signal. But then it's noisy, you have to be careful. I want to low pass first and differentiate, or differentiate and low pass, depending how you want to do it. And I want to, main, want to play around with the bandwidth of the low pass filter for the velocity as well. So there's a few things you can do. But, but that would be the simple thing to do. Let's go through the algorithm and look, look at the design uh, of the Kalman filter for various parameters and compare it with what you would do naively. Uh, so here's a, I'm just going to run a simulation. Uh, this is done with Simulink. I can uh, post <coughs> this model for you. Um, so I'm just going to simulate the plant. Here's that word again, the plant. <laughs> um, and then this is the observer. That's my simulator of the system. Mm. I have a band-limited white noise as my noisy measurement. So I'm going to play around with the, with the size of this noise. I have a, um, a signal generator. I'm just going to uh, basically drive, um, uh, make the system, drive the system with a step function. So just give it a, uh, a, <coughs> a kick back and forth. Uh, and then look at the result. So 
here's the input u, which is just a portion of a square, actually just a single kick. So it goes positive for a while, and then goes back down to 0. Um, actually, and then I repeat this process. Actually. And here's what the response. This is what you would expect. This is the position and velocity. It's a damped oscillator. So it's, it does exactly what you would expect. It would oscillate and then get damped out. Position and velocity similarly. So that's very intuitive. Um, so <clears throat> here's the situation with no noise. So no measurement noise and no input other than my uh, sort of uh, step input. Yes? Uh, sorry, I don't understand why we have three waves. Um, so perhaps first the initial condition till it balanced? Actually, what we have here is, is, um, is four waves. Uh, I've, you can't really quite see it. So this is, uh, this is the expansion of the initial phase here. I'll explain. Because I'm plotting the, the um, state and observer trajectory. So this is the state that has two components, velocity and position. And the observer has two uh, states, both position and velocity. And you can kind of see it here, right? So the observer state start at 0. Without uh, telling you the legend, which colors correspond to what, you can kind of guess. The observer state start at 0. The system initial state start at some non-zero. Right? So the yellow line. I don't know if you can see it from there. The yellow line must be the estimate of the blue state, because it converges to it. After that, you don't see a difference anymore. So from here on, you don't see a difference between the two, because there is no noise in this problem. The, um, the magenta line must be the estimate of the red one, because they converge to each other. OK, does that make sense? Uh, no, there was no my question, but it was also, I did not also not understand this part. Mm. But the, okay, uh, my question was why do we have three oscillations? So the one the first is. Oh, 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 sorry, I, I, th th this is misleading. The input repeats, it's a square wave. Okay. So, right? so yeah, kick, keep kicking it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's repeat. And I'm just showing you here, here I'm showing three cycles that actually this, the time scale here does not correspond to the time scale here. My oh, okay. mistake, mis sorry, uh, yes, misrepresenting. Yeah. Yes? You go one slide back. Or back or forward? Back. Oh, back. Don't you have to set the U? Where, where does U come from? U is the control input, right? U is the control input. Um, use the control input, it's a force. So if I but give how it. How do you decide what you use? Well, this is a linear system, so the magnitude of u doesn't matter. The response, everything will scale with the magnitude of u. Yeah. So as long as it's broad spectrum? Uh, it's not. Well, no, no, no. Remember, I've just decided to use u to make an interesting uh, experiment. I could use other u's as well. I'm going to add another input now, which is, which is noise. Okay. So, but this U is just to get the system to move, to do something interesting. Right? I've chosen this. You may choose a triangle wave, if you like. Or you may choose some other. Uh, yeah. But if you just chose sinusoidal wave, would that still work? Yes. Okay. It would still work. Yeah, it works for any U. Um, so, so here I designed the observer so that the decay rates are, uh, have a time constant of minus 1. Uh, they, so they get this kind of convergence. Here I designed the observer so that the decay rates have a time constant of minus 10, much more rapid. And you see, interesting thing, you see much faster convergence, <coughs> but also bigger initial overshoots. So here the estimate does something interesting. It actually veers away from the state it wants to estimate before it eventually converges to it. This is the mathematical problem, which I didn't go through, which finds a matrix L, or a vector, a two by one vector L in this case, such that the eigenvalues of this are at minus one. There is a procedure called pole placement for doing that, uh, standard, but uh, I'm not going to show you that. It's messy to write down. There's a standard algorithm to choose those, those gains. 
So uh, as opposed to um, having my knobs, which are the entries of this L, this feedback gain, instead my knobs are where should the closed loop eigenvalues be? And the algorithm automatically generates the L for me. Because I understand the dynamical behavior better in terms of the uh, eigenvalue locations than I do in terms of the gains. That's the idea behind it. In fact, it will turn out that I don't understand the dynamics very well in terms of the, uh, because for example, I can't explain this. I can't explain why with this choice now, I do get rapid convergence, but I also have an initial veering away from, uh, uh, from the, where the state is. And it turns out this is not a good way to design estimators. The Kalman filter, which I haven't shown you yet, is much better. So here's what happens in the presence of noise. So here's the original. So the one thing you should know is that this is not a very aggressive observer. It decays sort of in a moderate way. This is a very aggressive observer. I demand very rapid decay. You would expect a very aggressive observer to degrade more rapidly with noise, which is exactly what happens. So here's with a little bit of noise. Um, I keep the, I'm going to keep the noise level constant between this and the next experiment. This is for the first moderate observer. This is what the estimates look like. Now the estimates are no longer exactly on top of the states. After the initial period, they sort of wobble around. And you can quantify the variance of the error. That's what the Kalman filter minimizes. It minimizes the variance of the steady state error. So you see it wobbles around uh, and uh, but gives you, a, you know, an estimate. So here's what happens with the very aggressive observer. This is the one that converged like this very quickly. But in the presence of noise, it doesn't know what's going on. This gives you a very noisy estimate because it not, was not well designed. So those really are the trade-offs. If you want a very aggressive observer, you have to live with, with it being very sensitive to measurement noise. So uh, here's another example. I make it extremely conservative. So this is a it has a decay rate with a time constant of 0.1, very slow. So it really filters out the noise. It's like having a very uh, narrow bandwidth low pass filter, but it drifts. It doesn't track the, uh, the state very well, as you can see here. So, okay. Actually, I don't think I'm showing the common. The common filter basically here will give you the optimal choice given your selection of the weights. Um, so this, this choice, where, here. This choice corresponds to a, a certain, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, a certain um, size of input and noise and, and measurement noise. This choice is for a model where you assume that measurement noise was very small and you believe the model. So because measurement noise is very small, in this case, measurement noise threw you off. This choice is rough, roughly corresponds, if you did the common filter version of this, to a choice where you mistrust measurements, but you believe your model. So what ends up happening is that you filter out the measurement noise, but, uh, uh, but because you believe your, <coughs> you, be <coughs> excuse me, you, be you believe your model, you sort of drift away. Mm -hmm. So let's see what that means in terms of what you would do if you just designed a filter naively. So, so I can, uh, um, what I will do now is show you the frequency response from the system output. Um, now I'm going to show you the frequency response of the observer from, uh, yes, from the system output to the velocity. So the, the so from the, uh, from the position measurement to velocity which you would have designed as a low-pass filter derivative. Um, so ignore these. Let's look at, uh, let's look at this. Okay. This is the very aggressive observer. 
Everybody, does everybody know what, uh, what the frequency response of a diff differentiator look like? It goes up, by slope of zero. It goes up yeah. It goes up uh, by slope of, of 1, basically, here, or on a, on a log log plot. So you'll see it go up like that. Um, if you low pass it, then it will go up. But then at some point, it, will, it has to, to come back down, depending on where you put the bandwidth of the low pass filter. So a very aggressive observer basically looks like a differentiator for a certain range of frequencies. And then eventually it gets low passed. So in this frequency range, it's a differentiator. If you, I make it really, really aggressive, so having a, um, a really, really fast uh, decay rate, then it becomes a differentiator over a longer time range. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the obvious case. What happens if I make it sort of moderate? Um, do I have those plots? Uh, oh, I don't actually. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, shoot, that's that's the, the point I wanted to make. Uh, can I let let's let me um, let me let me draw it for you. Okay. Um, it will look something like this. Well, it's too bad I don't have that. It, it's not going to look anything like a differentiator. Okay, it's going to look something like this. Why is it the Oh yes, it is. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, sorry. Yes, yes. That's eigenvalues minus ten, minus one hundred, minus three, minus one. Okay, there. Yeah. Okay, there. There it is. For moderate choice and a even more moderate choice, right? Here, it doesn't look like a differentiator at all. Yeah? So what could it be doing? Why is, not, why is it not differentiating? Why is it doing something? What does it know that a differentiator doesn't know? That's the question. What it knows is this, the system equations. It knows that. Velocity and positions have to be related by an equation like this, related to a term acceleration which you can't measure directly, but there's some constraints. It knows the spring constant, and it knows the damping constant. Okay? So it knows something about the dynamics of the system, and that helps you estimate velocity from position by doing something which is not pure differentiation. You actually have more knowledge than that. You would use a differentiator if you knew nothing about the internal dynamics. You only knew that this is position and you want to estimate the velocity of that mass. But you don't know what it's connected to. Then you would simply differentiate and put it through a low pass filter. But what the observer does is it uses the system dynamics. So this is, that's why it's, it's an observer based uh, or a model based filter, if you will. So this is model based signal processing, if you will. Uh, that's really the key idea. So it's got a non-zero gain at zero frequency, it seems, right? Yes, of the the filter. It's got a DC, DC gain there. Yes. Um, so saying uh, even if nothing changes, I, I could get a best estimate of the state to be something, right? Uh, something. Uh. For this case? Uh, yeah, yeah, this case has a large gain, yes. There's some gain there, right? There is some gain, yes. Um, uh, let's see. What this, this is an a asymptotically stable observer, meaning that if you have no noise, then uh, as t goes to infinity, you will get the correct estimate of the velocity. And uh, you're proposing an experiment where you put in, um, where you get. Uh, uh I guess all I'm saying is uh, that you know, in, in the, the idea of differentiating, you've got zero, zero gain and zero frequency, right? Right. Whereas here you've got some finite gain and zero frequency, which means it's got some sort of uh, transmitting to a DC. Uh, are you saying it's got a bias? No, I'm just Nothing, yeah. no, I'm just wondering. What, I'm not objecting to it. I'm just trying yeah. to understand. <laughs> yeah, it's just it does have non-zero gain at DC. Yeah. It's a because differentiator does not. Yeah. Differentiator with, with a low-pass filter does not, but this one does. 
The optimal one, depending on, let's say, you, you assumed uh, uh, some, com if you assume some sort of non-trivial measurement noise, the optimal one will kind of look more like this one. Other questions? Hmm? Yes? I have a general question because I told me about learning for control, but now my question is where is the control? You know, we oh. just have state estimation. Yes. So how does this link to control? Okay, I'm I'm coming I'm gonna do the control piece separately. So so uh, uh, Let me show you, there, there are several different control problems, but in the hour and a half I have today, I'm going to look at the uh, controllability or reachability problem. Okay, let me, let me uh, state that. So, uh, okay, but before I move on, any other questions about the estimation problem? If there is a non-zero position, and you knew that, uh, uh, yeah, but I mean the the um, if the <coughs> I think what what um, what he's asking is that if you have a um, if this is a stable system, so you have a, a non-zero position output that is constant, doesn't change. So that's what the what the steady state gain reflects. The velocity should be zero. So it's not moving. The position is determined only by the spring constant, not by the dash part, right? Yes. So it has a it has a resting position that is determined only by the spring constant. Right. Right. So there is some non-zero u that is folding in there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But 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 I I um, I agree with you that it seems to me that uh, uh, the the gain should be zero at zero. I'm confused now. Yes. I I have to revisit this. Yes, I may may have made a mistake somewhere, but uh, but uh, but the general idea is as I as I was uh, trying to explain that having a model does help you to the estimation versus not having a model. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Here? Yeah. No, B plays no role in this problem, in the estimation problem. Uh, um, so if you, oh, if I'd gone through that calculation, uh, because I know the input that's going in, it cancels out from the error system. It plays no role in the error dynamics because it assumes that I know it. Yeah, but if I have uh, typically, I don't know uh, because I uh, the, my model also assumes um, disturbances in the input as well. So the u that I feed into my estimator, maybe that's the answer. The u that I feed into my estimator is not the u that uh, actually goes. You don't believe that it's the same u that goes into your plant. But still, I, I, I okay. Uh, I, there is an issue there. I'm not. I'm, I don't fully understand what it is right now. Uh, let me move on. That, that's okay. <coughs> okay. So <coughs> let me um, show you three different possible control problems you can pose. So you have a again here just done in general for nonlinear systems. This is a nonlinear differential equation, uh, and for the uh, and let's say possibly you could have an output. So one problem is stabilizing a possibly unstable equilibrium. Uh, that's one problem. The inverted pendulum stabilization problem belongs to that class. Another problem might be the the steering or reachability problem. Find the input u such that the state goes from one position in state space to another. 
Okay? That's, I will, that's the problem we're going to talk about now. Another possibility, which is a variation on this, is find the input U to steer not the state, but steer the output, and make it, uh, uh, and make it equal to some signal uh, as a function of time. This is called the tracking problem. And they're a little bit different. Okay? So I'm going to address this problem, because a few, I can say a few interesting things uh, here. So here's another example <coughs> that may give you some intuition. Uh, ignore the circuit. Let's look at this example. Two masses connected to the ground by springs and dampers and connected by a bar. And I apply a force uh, at the bar. Assume the bar has negligible mass. So it's the same force applied simultaneously on both masses. Okay. Now, if the spring constants and the damping constants and the masses are equal, uh, do you expect that this system is controllable? In the sense that, say, I can make it dance whichever way I want. There's less uniformity. Probably not, right? <coughs> um, so uh, this, is, this diagram is a little bit uh, 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 deceiving. The, 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 the bar is not, um, is not really rigidly connecting the masses. So the masses can have the small eigenvalues of this, meaning the large eigenvalues of W. Then that's an easy control problem. It takes a very small control to get there. If it happens to correspond to very large eigenvalues, of, so the eigenvector of very large eigenvalues, then that, that corresponds to very small eigenvalues of W. Then it takes a large amount of control. That's the best possible control that's still very large to get to that state. That state is hard to reach. That's really how you quantify the difficulty of reaching certain target states. Let me show you an example here. Are you yes? Using a star and b star, over there? Uh, star means transposed here. Oh, sorry, transposed. Yeah, yeah, transposed. Okay. I just write star because it's oh. just more okay. standard notation. Okay. Yeah, Complex conjugate transpose. Okay. So here everything is real. So it's just transpose. Yes? And how is R not dependent on T? Is this is any function? Right. So <coughs> this is, if you fix your time horizon, you say, I want to do this maneuver in a certain amount of time, that's the solution. And I'll show you, actually, uh, dependence on T in a minute. Typically, if T is short, the size of U is big, bigger than if T is longer. Uh, I'll show, actually, this is exactly what I'm going to show you here. So here's uh, the. Um, the state I want to reach is 1, 0, minus 1, 0. That means uh, I think these are the positions. I want the upper, the, this mass to go be here, this mass to be here with zero velocity. So I want to move from here to here with, uh, up, not with zero, of course I need velocity to move, but I want to move so that at time, in this case time 60, uh, I may do you know, oscillations, but at time 60 I want to stop here with zero velocity at position 1 and minus 1. OK? Everybody visualize that? OK? This is what the optimal control is. That's the optimal force, meaning minimum mean squared size. And this is what the states do. <coughs> this is relatively long. The time here is relatively lo long compared to the oscillation frequency or the, the period of the system. So you don't bother to do anything. You, just you sort of tickle it a little bit. And then use the system's natural oscillations to set it up. So you are doing something right from the beginning, are you? You are doing something in the beginning. Right? But because, because I want the smallest control possible, mm -hmm. and I have lots of time yeah. to do this, then the, it's, the control uses the system's natural oscillations mm -hmm. to do the work. It's just, it's very small. It's very small, yeah, 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 just compared to that. Wouldn't be uh, an everyday application if you want to move some heavy object, like if a car is stuck, right, in the snow, and then you try to get it out of the snow, then you start pushing it. And then you you, force, but you're to get you use the, the natural oscillations. Yeah, you sort of want to resonate. Isn't that the That's exactly it. It's, it's sort of using, when I said using the natural system oscillations, that's what I meant. It's sort of trying to 
resonate with it. Because I have lots of time. That's, um, that's important. Right? And then eventually it will move to exactly where I want it. Okay? So l look at the size here. So this is 1. The peak value is 1. And I take 60 time units. Suppose I do the same problem, but I want to do it in 5 time units. Then my control action has to be much more aggressive. I have no... I, I still use the, the sort of the natural, I have to use the system dynamics to my advantage, but I'm not just tickling it and waiting for it to build up amplitude. I have to sort of find sort of a, an important trajectory. Uh, like, a, sorry, not, uh, I mean a uh, sort of the best tra trajectory in the shortest amount of time. Typically with these problems, when you have a lot of time to wait and the system is oscillatory, then the control basically tries to use the system's natural frequency. But when the time is short, it has to do something else, which is very difficult to predict ahead of time. Right? So you wouldn't be able to design this without using the math. At least I wouldn't be able to. Right? And the size is bigger here, 4, but not that much bigger. So. And the basic optimum uh, expression for the optimum Actually, this, it is simpler here because, in, in general, for, <coughs> for general nonlinear systems with uh, objectives that are not uh, quadratic, then uh, you would use some version of the calculus of variations. But in this case, it was easy to <coughs> do the. Uh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is a standard least squares problem, which is easy to do. Yeah. So you don't need to appeal to, well, you, you need to differentiate something, right? Yeah. But, but here, because you have explicit forms for the solution in terms of the matrix exponential, you but can. In this case, you're saying you can derive the solution just in the back of an envelope. Yes, I yes. This, is, this, right. this would be a, like a one-page homework exercise yeah. in that course, yes. Yeah, not, not very difficult. Um, let me show you something a little more interesting. Um, so what? What happens <coughs> in the case when you have distributed control to a similar situation, to a similar uh, uh, sort of reachability problem? Um, and this is something that I think even, this is from my course which I teach on distributed control, but I think this is something that's not very widely understood in the, in the controls community. Uh, this is a very simple example again that illustrates the, uh, an important point. So I'm gonna look at a one-dimensional medium in which the dynamics are diffusion. So think of heating a, a bar of a metal bar or diffusion in a one-dimensional medium. But I have control. So here <coughs> I have an input. So I can uh, put in a flux. And I have, I'm going to compare two situations. Here I have distributed control. I can put in a flux, uh, both positive and negative, by the way, uh, everywhere in space. So u is a function. My control is a function of both space and time. So I have a lot of control, uh, of the sort of uh, uh, a lot of control authority, if you will. I can inject flux everywhere. So there's many, many, many controls. Compared to the situation where I'm restricted to put flux only here, so only at that point, and I want to influence the rest of the system <coughs> through the natural dynamics, through putting a flux here, allowing it to diffuse, and then working with the natural dynamics. Naturally, you would think that this is a more difficult problem than this. And yes, and we'll see in which way. The mathematical models, uh, in the distributed case, you have the heat equation, uh, standard heat equation. Uh, psi is the state now. X is a spatial uh, coordinate. It's no longer a state for this example. And the control is also distributed. It's a function of both space and time. In the pointwise control case, Control is really just a scalar function of time, and it enters through this delta function. This is an idealized model. Now you can go and do the same exact calculations of this Gramian, uh, and uh, it's, it's more involved because this is a PDE, but conceptually, it's, everything works out the same. But there are some important uh, uh, conclusions. So I'm going to investigate <coughs> the reachability of certain target states. And I want you to use your uh, physical intuition for this. This is for the distributed control problem. 
So this is for this bar right here, okay? which is the easier problem compared to that other one. Uh, I would like, in case one, I would like the temperature profile at a, some target time to be this. Uh, the second case, I would like the temperature profile to be this thing with a sharp corner. And then I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to demand that the temperature profile be this. OK? Now, you would, should expect that to be extremely difficult, right? Because the natural dynamics are diffusive. And you want to make a temperature profile with a sharp edge, the system will fight you at every, uh, at every time unit, right? So the way you can quantify this is, again, through this quadratic form. What I'm plotting here are the eigenvalues of the Gramian for this problem. Their decay rate determines, <coughs> uh, so um, small eigenvalues of W inverse means good, means easily controllable. So small eigenvalues of W means really hard to control. Okay, so small eigenvalues W inverse means this is a huge number. So that's a really hard thing to control because it requires very large control inputs. So the mode corresponding to eigenvalues over here will be very difficult modes to control. Uh, this is the Fourier expansion of, of those three functions. Uh, the, uh, let's not parse through this, but basically this is the, uh, this, these are the Fourier, the, the modes of the system with distributed control are simple. They are just the modes of the diffusion operator over a finite uh, length. So that is just your typical sinusoid that satisfies the boundary condition. And this is the, this corresponds to the simple, the smoothest target state. This is the, uh, triangular wave, and this is the square wave. And the ratio of these determines how difficult it is to control. Let me show you uh, what, uh, so the theoretical statement is as follows. Uh, <coughs> uh, I cannot reach this target state with the, um, with the, um, with the triangle, with the rectangular wave, but I can approximate it arbitrarily closely. And as you would imagine, it gets more and more difficult to do that. Uh, this I can reach, or <coughs> sorry, I can approximate it, but the approximation has a different uh, uh, property, which I'll show you. And this one is easy to reach. So here's what the minimum energy control looks like for the triangular wave. Uh, look at the top picture. This is the state trajectory. So I start with a, uh, let's say, everything, the uh, uh, temperature constant at zero. Zero is just some nominal value. Uh, and I want to reach the triangular wave. And this is the minimum L2 norm control uh, that does it. And as you see, it, uh, it sort, of, sort of very gentle initially. But just before the end time that I've specified, it has actually, uh, theoretically, this actually goes to infinity. In order to maintain, a, in order to reach this sharp corner, in fact, this has to go to infinity. This is a very large input. And then if you think about it, why does it wait till the very end to do that? If you, if you didn't wait till the very end, uh, you, because remember, diffusion is fighting you at every step of the way. No, so. You would have diffused out. Yeah. No, but I would always increase, keep increasing U. So well, but this is the minimum energy. This is right, the minimum U that does it. Right, right. U is a constraint. See, <coughs> what you can't diffuse out. If you diffuse out beyond that point, you've lost the game. There's no way you can, you can recover, <coughs> right? <laughs> if, because, it, because you're asking it to reach a sharp corner, uh, and that's the di system dynamics are working against that, what it does, and you only said reach it at that time. It just waits till the very end before it kicks the input at that point in order to, to set that up. The, and then, of course, it doesn't care what happens after that. After that, you diffuse out. In comparison with reaching this smooth uh, profile, 
the system, the, the input, the input is sort of nice and doesn't have any, any peaks that go to infinity. So this is a much easier target state to reach, sorry, here, than this. Even though, again, the, both of these are controllable in that sense, but then you could see that this is much less controllable than that, because it requires crazy controls but to get to this state. But I'm still a little puzzled about how you achieve that linear gradient um, at here? the end. Because typically, if you give a point source, uh, well, a point source will give you some kind of exponential decay. What is that? What's the diffusion uh, But I don't have a point source here. Yeah, I, have, well, yeah, no, I have distributed. Source, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have a but, distributed uh, source. But the, the, it's effecti effectively a point source, and until the very end, it's almost zero. And then all of a sudden, bang, you have a. Uh, well, it's sort of, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to see here. That, yeah. But it's sort of, uh, it's kind of trying to build up a triangular profile. Yeah, it's sort of building up a triangular profile here. Now, I want to compare this. Again, I told you that in the, uh, in the, you can't really see that. This is really the object that is most important for this approximate controllability problem. So that's Gramian. I can, uh, and this Gramian, by the way, is the integral of <coughs> So it doesn't depend just on the on the A matrix, it depends on the interaction between the input operator and the A matrix. And <coughs> here's the comparison of the eigenvalues of the Gramian. Notice the, the scale here, 10 to the minus 20. The Gramian of distributed control versus the Gramian of pointwise control. Okay, here you're sort of in the Randolph error, uh, machine precision floor. So they do decay essentially all of these modes are simply effectively not controllable, even though uh, that uh, you, know, you can technically you can be get arbitrarily close to any of these modes. And it would be inter it's interesting now to look at the mode shapes for the pointwise system. They don't look like the standard uh, mode of the diffusion operator. That's what they look like. This is the most controllable mode with pointwise input. This is the second most controllable mode, ranked by the order of the eigenvalues here. This is the third, fourth, and so on. And they decay pretty rapidly. So this is already highly non-controllable. Okay, this is the most uh, reachable, I should say. This is the most reachable. So in systems where you have a small number of inputs, the behavior is dramatically different than when compared to the case when you have a large number of distributed inputs. So this is important for networks. It's also important for um, uh, uh, distributed systems like this, uh, continuum systems. Any so questions? These are numerics. In fact, it is an open question. This has been studied, this one. It is an open question whether, uh, if I plotted this on a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, linear log scale, you'll see that it looks like a straight line, but which means it implies it sort of maybe decays exponentially, while this decays algebraically. It's an open question whether this actually decays exponentially. Yeah. Because as you improve the precision of the numerics, you use you more and more basis functions, the slope of that line changes. So it's a conjecture whether it's exponential or lies somewhere between exponential and polynomial. So, but nobody knows as of now. It's so like so a, it's an open problem. If it's exponential, it just means it's really very badly controllable. Essentially, most of the state space is inaccessible uh, from a control like this. Only, only basically, this identifies for you the most accessible uh, shapes. These temperature profiles would be relatively easy to set up without using a lot of flux. But very quickly, those, those get much, much harder. OK, other questions on this? Um, I'm just going to close with um, uh, model reduction. But I, uh, I, I don't, <coughs> I told you about uh, observability <coughs> and controllability. There is a way to uh, combine the two to do model reduction in the sense that uh, 
I have a system, let's say here, this is, again, this is the, this is the heat equation, again, with distribute, no, with pointwise control, actually, here. But here I have, think about this system, I have an infinite number of states, or if you will, a large number of states. I have a single input, and I have a single output. So in principle, I could describe that by, say, a transfer function. And I ask about, I ask the following question. <coughs> Take a system which has hundreds of states. Can I find new coordinates for the state space or a smaller number <coughs> of states such that the input-output behavior of this reduced model is close to the input-output behavior of the original big model? And that question can be addressed using a very successful technique uh, of model reduction and balanced truncation. Let me show you the results, for example. There's um, there's several versions of this. Uh, this is a, a frequency response, a body plot of the, uh, the heat equation system. Uh, this is the, um, the blue line is the original. And the other lines are, uh, this magenta and blue line are the, the results of Hankel, what's called Hankel model reduction technique with orders three and six. That means the reduced model has three states or six states. This is versus the original, which has 100 states, 200 states. And you see that the uh, representation is fairly faithful. You should look at the phase plot as well, up to a you know, frequency of about 100 uh, radians per second. Something, another technique called model truncation does, does a little bit worse. This is because that's actually an easy system to model reduce. Uh, do a similar thing for <coughs> a system this, that describes wave motion, the wave equation. Um, where is that? Here it is, yes. This is much more challenging. Uh, this is a damped wave equation. Uh, the original is uh, in the, I believe, the, uh, the green is the original, right? And the, no, no, the green, the blue is the original because it has many more, every peak corresponds to two modes, actually. And the green is the approximation. This is actually the result of a very well-designed model reduction technique. You could easily uh, screw this up. But you could see that um, it faithfully represents it again <coughs> uh, <coughs> up to a certain frequency uh, value. So that's, that's a, a, a big area in terms of uh, finding approximate models. <coughs> and of course, the utility for this for control is if you can design a controller for the reduced system, which has much fewer states, the controller typically is much less complex than the controller for the original system. If you can bound this error, you can actually get bounds on the performance of the controller designed using the simplified model as it performs on the real system. You can actually get uh, precise bounds on that. So let, let me end here. Uh, and. Um, so I'm not sure I satisfied your desire to see control done. Yeah, Most yeah, of it really yeah, was systems yeah. analysis. Didn't really do much control design, but uh, yeah. Yes? So what is the motivation uh, behind reduction of the model? Uh, is this computational power or? <coughs> good, good question. So, so most controllers designed are, um, are what are called observer-based or <coughs> designed using this sort of separation principle. So the inside of the controller is these two pieces. This is typically some kind of a static map, and this has dynamics, because this is the observer I showed you. The dimension of this, the number of states of this, is the same as the number state of the process, because I'm trying to uh, estimate all the states. If I take the wave equation and discretize it using a basis, say, 200, so I have 200 states, I'm going to need to build an estimator for all 200 states. So that's a very complex controller. But instead, if I use as the model, not the one with 200, but the one, say, with 20 that I've used, used the done used using model reduction, then the corresponding estimator, which is inside the controller, only has 20 states. So I'm reducing the model of the system, but really what I'm after in the end as a control designer is a simple controller that behaves well, that is close to the optimal one. Yes? So is there not somewhere an optimal reduction then, that you somehow you gain on computational need, but you then lose the, the precision of your controller? So 
you will lose some performance when you, yes, so in some sense you, you have less states and the controller means less, maybe less precision in the computation, you can think of it that way. But you lose a little bit, of, but if you do it right, you can come down from 200 to 20 states and lose only 1% of the performance. Now that's quite typical if you use the, those methods, yes. Is there some trade-off when you reduce, when, when you have a lot of variables, like, you know, for example, in estimation problems, um, then there are issues if they're, you know, like non-orthogonal features. There could be degeneracies associated with that. Um, and, and uh, you know, your estimation is actually poor. Uh, I'm not sure. Like that. <coughs> Um, I'm not sure I understood okay. your, your question, yeah. I mean, I, I let, me, let me give a, a sort of a typical example. Suppose you're trying to design, again, a sort of a flight control system for an airplane that has um, uh, somewhat flexible wings. I mean, you've all seen the wings of an airplane flex a little bit, right? But you use as a, uh, you use, and you use a high fidelity model of the entire airplane with the uh, with sort of a shell model for the wing, which has sort of, uh, with, which has lots and lots of modes. So it's easy to uh, develop, say, a finite element model for the, for the airplane with flexible wing that could have hundreds of states. You don't want your flight controller to have hundreds of states. Uh, even though, even if ideally its performance can be good, because, because for many reasons, Randolph error inside the controller would, would accumulate in ways that are unpredictable, Etc. Etc. You would want a controller that is actually much less. So it's very typical in those problems to be able to do model reduction, come down to something like 10 states, from hundreds to 10 states, and design a controller with 10 states that has performance very, very close to the optimal, if done correctly. So that's why these methods are useful. So within the domain of uh, neural science, uh, neural circuits. Where do you see some of the, uh, I know it's a very broad theory, you can yeah. apply to almost anything, but you have to talk about where, where the immediate applications are. My task was to, uh, as, as um, commissioned by Partha, <laughs> was to um, provide an introduction to this theory. Well, I, 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 think, uh, I think there are some, there's some broad questions. One is that, for example, uh, in robotics, Clearly, you are trying to um, actually make a body or uh, some actuator do something. So, in a sense, that really is what uh, is very core in control theory. So, I think it's clear that if one is doing robotics or one is studying anything in biology that is like robotics, which is locomotion. I'm interested in terms of gate, for example. You know? Uh, actually, what gate, I didn't gate, gate. gate. What I didn't explain. Uh, let me connect with what I said this morning, because this seems maybe a little bit removed. But these optimal calculations, optimal control calculations, are what you do, or they're, they're very much like what you do when you calculate those limits of performance I showed you. For example, for balancing the pendulum this morning. See, what's so what's it's fascinated me is that uh, you can tell, for example, the the race of a person quite often from their gait. I'm wondering whether different races are optimizing different performance criteria. Different what? performance criteria. No, different water optimizing. <coughs> different races. Yeah. In terms of walking, for example, okay. or running. And if well, if you open, would run well, maybe your own strategy. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I think yeah. the, uh, I think it's more. Uh, I think there are two kinds of applications. One is. If one is either building a robot or building a prosthetic yeah. or something like that, then yeah. the applications are clear, right? Sure. Yeah. That, 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 that's okay, it. but now um, uh, I think the way I think about it is nature had to solve the same problem when the yeah. animal was moving, okay. or even if it when it was behaving, yeah. right? So it is maybe not an external locomotor behavior, yeah. but it could be some internal behavior. It had to solve the same dynamical problem, yeah. and then the question arises. Is it using the same sort of solution that a control engineer would have used? So that that's the question I would ask. Yeah. And um, one, you know, we were just discussing this one question, which is, uh, can one study the sensors <coughs> divorced from the actuators? Yeah. 
and uh, if, if there is some resulting control theory about the separation of the sensing right. from the actuation, which yeah. is of a theoretical nature, um, the conditions under which that can occur. Um, in neuroscience, I guess one almost seldom asks this question. People study the senses divorced from yeah. what the senses are used for. Um, so it would be interesting theoretically if there is a result that says yes, they can be so divorced. Or if there's a result that says no, they cannot be divorced, and here is how they would link up. To, to me, even in the motor control, you know, for example, running a marathon versus running a 100 meter dash, you know, the gates are very different. And one is probably an energy optimal gate, the, the marathon, and the other one probably a, I don't know, time optimal gate. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So it'd be interesting to study those. Actually, the, the trajectories I showed you, if I, you do time optimal yeah. control, will look very different. Yeah. Actually, that's a Maybe I should have. I mean, uh, that would have been an interesting just, just example to work out. Yeah. Or anything like that, you know, uh, or even an animal, and just trotting along, trying to get, you know, cover a long distance compared to getting from A to B in the shortest possible time. I, I, I think the one needs mm. to get away from purely behavioral modeling mm. because that's a lot of what people do in motor control. Mm. I think one needs to get at the underlying circuits and the architecture of the system and try to see if that architecture follows. I think that would be the idea that if we can get some insights from <coughs> engineering, um, does the biological system follow those insights? Because the sensory periphery is, I think, usefully thought of from the point of view of signal <coughs> processing, right? But the rest of the system is not really being thought of in the same sort of engineering terms. And uh, one can ask about the actual architecture of the system, the way the circuit is set up in the system, the way the even uh, maybe there is design involved in the um, actuators themselves. And I should say that control theory is by no means a fully developed subject. Uh, the questions that have been addressed are typically motivated by uh, aerospace control and, and chemical process control. Uh, you may think up questions that have not been addressed. You, with, you may think up of questions that you think we should have addressed, but we have, people haven't in control theory. So it's, it's by no means a, a fully developed subject. So, so for example, um, this morning, I think you were talking about you know, the use of the vestibular signals as well as the visual signals to aid in you know, fixating a, a target. Mm -hmm. So uh, have people modeled, for example, using plasma filtering, you know, how best to combine the signals from these two sensors to affect the motor control? You know, so so yes, so yeah, this, this area goes, yeah. This area goes by the name of sensor fusion. Yes. So typically, you already have that in your in a in a GPS navigator. Yeah. Uh, you have typically two things. You have the the GPS signal, which is because has a lot of error, relatively, uh, but it gives you the position. But you also have accelerometers built in, mm -hmm. which give you a fairly accurate acceleration reading. Uh, but there's drift with that. So you combine the two, typically with a common filter. Uh, to get much better estimates, so and so that's um. This in the biological context, Yes, indeed. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can't think off the top of my head of, of references on that. Yeah, yeah I think uh, a lot of control people tend to um, sort of shy away from these questions because of the because biology is hard. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's perceived. Uh, that's part of the reason why we are <laughs> trying to have, you yeah. know, bring these communities yeah. together. Because I think that, yes, there are some applications of uh, some aspects of control theory already in neurobiology. Uh, but at least as far as I have seen, they are either limited to modeling behavior, um, where it boils down to um, kind of data fits at the end of the day from what I have seen. Because you don't really go inside mm. the system and, and look at what its architecture is doing, um, or um, maybe the more modern advances in controls have not really caught up. Where I think there has been some uh, some crosstalk a while ago is in physiology. So people thinking about physiological control systems inside your body, mm. uh, people have applied some amount of Classical 
Yeah, systems biology is systems is, a, is, a, is a big deal these right, days. Right. Yes, so yes. People are mm. somehow going into cell biology with control theory methods and it seems natural to apply the neuroscience, but I think it is still lagging. And partly because the neuroscience, perhaps because of words like information, people are kind of stuck in a certain theoretical space, um, information theory, and not really venturing into the more dynamical system space. Mm. And that's part of our agenda here. Too. So people think of the brain as an information processor as opposed to a, a controller. controller yeah. mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. uh, but people may have questions. Other questions on what I said today or this morning? Yeah, you d actually you don't. In, in the filter, you, what you keep is always the current estimate. Where is the filter here? Yeah. So this is your, your so this is your estimator. You so just your matrices grow and grow. No, no, they don't. No. They don't. They don't. I only gave that as an intuition as to why is it that you can observe a single output and determine a hundred states from them, because you're observing over time. But if this algorithm, if I wrote this algorithm in discrete time, so I didn't write the time dependence. This is x hat of t u of t, y of t. If I wrote it in discrete time, I would say x hat at time t plus 1 is equal to something that depends on x hat and u at the time before, mm -hmm. but not two steps before. Uh -huh. it's just one no, step. no, it's a recursive algorithm that you only need to keep as many variables as you have states in the model. Yeah, otherwise it would, there would be an explosion of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a recursive estimation algorithm mm -hmm. and you can show that it is optimal. Nice you don't have to, you can throw away yeah, you can throw away the past. All of that, all of the past is encoded in the current, you know, the best thing about your estimates in the past are already encoded in your current estimate. That's the way it, it works out. There are no further questions, so we shall hand it over to you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you.